Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for our November lunchtime webinar. Um, as you know, today we're going to be talking about tackling education advantage, widening the lens. Uh, my name's Emma Knights. I'm Chief Executive at NGA, and I'm joined by Fiona Fearon, Policy and Projects Manager, who you might remember did a webinar on this topic over a year ago. And since then, um, we have been uh, compiling the resources that we'll be talking about today. So I, many of you will know how we do these. These webinars, I'm afraid, uh, are much more like lectures. You'll be listening to the two of us. In this case, we are going to take the full um, 40 minutes. However, um, we do very much like to hear from you in the chat. And particularly with this piece of work, we'll be taking note of any questions and uh, using those to inform the next stage of the project that we'll talk about uh, right at the end. You do get the slides sent to you, um, but also you um, uh, will be able to uh, have a recording of this, uh, which will be available very shortly. So please do share that with, with colleagues. Really, really happy for that to be watched, as indeed they are, hundreds of times after the day itself. And as always uh, at NGA, we like to begin uh, by thanking you uh, for what you do uh, for your pupils, for your schools um, every uh, week in, week out. It is a privilege to support you. So uh, in this session, we're going to be talking about what do we actually mean by disadvantaged, but then how can we actually lose the labels and hone in on the needs? What exactly is your role as the governing board in addressing that need or ensuring the need is addressed? Uh, and then we will be talking to you about the toolkit that we are publishing today. And Fiona will talk in particular about uh, 20 top tips in there, but also um, send uh, poverty and vulnerability. So let me start, um, first of all, by looking at what do we mean by disadvantage? Actually, we've really adopted a very common sense uh, interpre interpretation of disadvantaged. Any child whose experiences of life put them in a less favorable position to learn than their peers. That's what we mean in the broader sense by being at an educational uh, disadvantage. So you might be thinking, well, hasn't somebody defined it? Isn't there an official definition? Um, and the answer is no. Uh, the DfE um, do, as I'm sure um, all of you on this call are aware, um, make the pupil premium available to support um, some disadvantaged pupils who fit very specific criteria. And those criteria are, are largely socioeconomic, financial criteria, pupils um, who have been eligible for free school meals over a period of time, pupils who have been adopted from care or have left care and children who are being looked after by the local authority. So, so very specific, but actually um, the DfE in their governance handbook also talk about the role of governors and trustees in terms of broader disadvantage, which they don't define. So we've been thinking about that really carefully and looked at a number of other pupil groups who are statistically more likely to be at a disadvantage. So we didn't just sit in a small room in Birmingham and dream these up. Um, Fiona in particular has spent a lot of time um, looking at uh, the literature. Uh, in order to ensure that what we produce is absolutely evidence-based and practice-based. So here um, are our five uh, dimensions of, of uh, disadvantage. We've started uh, with children living in poverty, but we're broadening that to not just mean those who are in receipt of pupil premium, but others um, who are poor, even though they are um, not uh, uh, entitled to pupil premium. 
Secondly, going around that uh, diagram there, um, certain ethnic minority groups. And that word certain is really important. Um, again, we've looked at this quite forensically. Um, we're absolutely aware of the debates that we can't um, uh, lump together uh, different people from different um, ethnic or, or cultural backgrounds. So we, um, Fiona will talk a little bit later about which particular groups we've picked out because of the uh, research and the evidence. We've then used the word vulnerability to cover um, children on a child protection plan or a need plan, an early help plan, or those children that um, are known to the youth offending service, a looked after child um, and a young carer. So we've, we've um, included uh, that uh, there. Then the group of pupils that are um, experiencing uh, low well-being, struggling with their emotional or mental health, and coming round our, our graphic um, to send, uh, which of course is a hugely topical and important um, issue at the moment. And as you can see, our diagram uh, tries to point out that um, you know children, well, none of us, none of us people slot nicely into into any boxes or in this case any circles um, we there may well be pupils that um, fall into more than one of those groups so this absolutely isn't about um, putting labels um, onto onto young people there are a few groups you might be there going why aren't they there we did debate whether to include gender and we will be coming back to that topic later in the year but for now uh, we haven't included gender and in fact white working class boys are perhaps an example of where they might fall into more than one of those circles um, individual by by individual so i'm now going to hand over uh, to fiona who's going to uh, look at the those five um, dimensions. Over to you, Fiona. Thanks. Thanks, Emma. I'm not on mute, am I? No. Okay. So um, these dimensions um, effectively form part of a toolkit that we've put together, and I'll cover that a little bit later. But we're going to start out by looking at some of the data um, that's out there. So really kind of going through each of the pupil groups and saying, as, as Emma said, this is the statistical data that's out there. And also um, having worked in the education sector frontline myself, my experience of of, um, of the, those pupils that are specifically um, more likely to be an educational disadvantage. So um, just starting off with those children who um, may be identified as having special educational needs and disabilities. Um, so first of all, there's just some figures there on the number of children that were identified as having an EHCP plan. Um, and um, just in terms of how SEND can, can um, impact on educational disadvantage, in 2021, the DfE published some data that said 18.3% um, of pupils with special educational needs achieved a grade five or above in English and maths. And that's compared to the, um, the national average of 58% with no identified need. Um, also thinking about exclusions as well, exclusion rates. So children with an EHCP plan are 2.5 times more likely to be permanently excluded than their non-SEN peers. And those with SEN support are five times more likely with children than children. Um, oh, sorry, with children with social, emotional and mental health needs um, record, being recorded as the highest rates. And that really speaks into how, um, how the experiences of children with special educational needs may play out in um, it may play out in behaviour, et cetera, and a lack of understanding of, of the issues that they're facing and how that may play out in behaviour can lead to those exclusions. Um, poverty, so 75% of children currently growing up in poverty live in a household where at least one adult is working and as a result may not be eligible for, for free school meals. So this is really thinking about the next point where 37% um, of children in England are living in poverty but aren't entitled. So it's not quite as easy to identify that particular pupil group. Um, 
and pupils who are eligible for free school meals make made less progress um, than their their peers which and the, the data is just there so it's just really thinking about how does poverty impact on educational disadvantage um, of the, the educational disadvantage of those pupils next slide please Emma um, vulnerability so Emma's already um, gone through what we define vulnerability as being quite a nuanced term so we recognize that um, but just some of the data um, the data behind how children who are identified as vulnerable can be at a disadvantage in their education um, so children who had a social worker in their GCSE year uh, were identified as around half as likely to achieve a strong pass in maths and English than their peers. 27% of young carers aged 11 to 15 miss school or experience challenges in their education and achieve on average a grade of uh, a one grade lower than their peers in GCSE. So it's really important to understand how that impacts on um, their education um, and children on a child in need plan. Again, coming back to this point about exclusion rates, children on a child in need plan are four times more likely to receive a permanent exclusion than their peers and children on a child protection plan are three and a half times more likely. Next slide, please. So pupil mental health and wellbeing as well, also one of our, um, our pupil groups. So the higher strength and difficulties questionnaire, that's a tool that schools use, um, school counsellors and school staff may use um, to, um, to measure um, mental health and well-being with um, in their children. So understanding, um, underst in understanding society, this meant that every one point increase in the young person's SDQ score um, um, at 11 to 14 was equal to dropping one grade at GCSE um, at the age of 16. So really important to look at how that impacts on their education. Um, children with poor mental health are more likely to be excluded. And mental health difficulties increase with absenteeism. So with children facing mental health challenges, twice as likely to miss school than their peers. Next slide, please. OK, and then ethnicity. So some stats on ethnicity again. This, this, this is certain ethnic minority groups, not all. Um, so children from black Caribbean backgrounds are three times more likely to be excluded than their white peers and on average 34 months behind academically um, by the end of year 11. Um, and some research, really interesting research report that the YMCA did um, so the lack of diversity in curriculum was considered to be a barrier to 43% of young black people achieving in schools, according to research carried out by the YMCA. And we've got a bit of a table there, just looking at some of the pupil groups, um, some, of the, the, some of the ethnicity groups, sorry, and the gap in months by the time they get to the end of year 11. And this is, again, it's not about putting labels on, and this is not every child's story, but it's really important to look at um, what 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 is going on this, for, for us as as as, as governors um, and trustees within our schools? What's going on um, with our systems and processes um, that impacts on the on this attainment gap and these exclusion figures? Um, and kind of which we'll move on to a little bit later, but really getting out out of that deficit thinking um, and that deficit discourse around it being an issue with the pupils and 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 not ourselves. Thank you, Fiona. And that leads uh, beautifully onto that point that she was just making, um, that what we're not encouraging you to do is think, oh, gosh, this is, uh, you know, five more groups that I need to um, uh, monitor uh, in, and, and label and decide that, yes, for all these groups of children, we're going to do X. Um, actually, what we need to do, as we're quoting here from um, addressing educational disadvantages in schools and colleges, is the Essex way, um, is schools must identify pupil need and base their strategies on this. It's critical that strategies focus on pupils' needs rather than any labels that might be ascribed to them. And you may be thinking, well, that's really obvious, 
but actually it's much easier for um, uh, Mark Rowland and him, his, his book to, to be saying that or Fiona and I to be sitting here and saying it than actually doing it. So this is the idea of the, the toolkit to help you make that um, a reality and look at what the governing board's um, roles are uh, in this. It's really about making sure that that um, approaches that schools use in order to help uh, young people um, thrive to the same extent of their peers, really do tackle it, tackle the needs, tackle the disadvantages, tackle the barriers. And again, you may say to me, um, but Emma, that's incredibly obvious. It is, isn't it, when you put it like that, but actually it's been something that's been worrying us since a piece of research we did in 2018. Now this was only about the pupil premium and not about the full range of disadvantaged children, but it really shone a spotlight on this, uh, this absolute issue, which was the analysis. Um, so it was research that was based both on survey data, but an analysis of pupil premium statements, which is, as I'm sure you all know, have to be published on the website, but goodness me, nobody actually looks at them. So our team looked at a number of them. And what we found was there were lots of barriers identified and lots of um, interventions that the money was spent on, but the two things didn't relate to each other. A list of barriers that actually um, had no connection with the list of solutions. So this is really what we are hoping to do today, to say, actually, when the school has identified the barriers, the solutions need to relate um, to those. So identifying those individual pupils needs um, is first and foremost and then you look at so is it a sort of a learning centered intervention that's required is it about quality of teaching for that particular um, pupil or are there other barriers that are preventing the young people uh, learning that need to be addressed and one of the issues here of course is so what is your role in this um, so much of this will be done by senior leaders and indeed by other members of, of staff working directly uh, with the pupil. So what is your role? You need to understand, well, how is that identification of need happening um, within your school or trust? How do um, the staff then work out what response is needed? And once they have got responses underway, it's your job to look at are they making a difference? So, of course, you need to know um, the data surrounding um, uh, this, but perhaps it's about looking at that data slightly differently. Um, I'm sure you will be doing comparisons uh, with the national dent data, um, looking at pupils' um, uh, achievement, looking at their progress, benchmarking um, that. It's obviously more useful once you come lower down to your own context, looking at that local um, data. But then the school leaders, the teachers, other staff potentially will need to be looking at this pupil by pupil. So what we're saying is when you are um, looking at the data, uh, cross-reference these two um, lists. I hope that you will already be seeing the data we've got there on the right-hand side, progress and attainment, attendance, safeguarding, behaviour. Um, what are you learning from parent and pupil voice? And I say I hope you are, but actually we know from our annual survey data that actually not every governing board does do this. So when you do have this sort of data, you want to be asking, how does this relate to the different um, pupil groups? As Fiona already said, for example, looking at 
exclusion um, uh, data uh, against the different uh, the different pupil groups. Actually, there's you know our list of relevant data could have been even even longer. One that sticks with me um, is what as a school that talked to us about their um, uh, extracurricular data and who was actually joining the activities, and they found that there was um, um, barriers to certain disadvantaged pupils doing that. And I do remember young carers in particular who were having to go home straight away after school to pick up those caring responsibilities and couldn't stay on uh, to, do, to do other things. So it's about asking questions in that way. I'm not going to talk about the different data sources that are there. There's other that are there. There are other um, uh, guidance on both our website, but also on the DFE's website that talks about uh, data at a national level and what can be pulled out for for your school. Um, but it just seemed an omission for us not to include this um, in the in the slide um, uh, set. But the bit that perhaps is sometimes missed out of that data is then what um, are those that are involved in the situation? What's their take on it? What do they think the need is? And again, um, uh, referring to the, the Essex way, and actually I think I should do a big shout out, I didn't at the beginning, uh, particularly to Mark Rowland, who we have um, quoted there, who works um, for Unity Schools Partnership, uh, particularly looking at improving outcomes for disadvantaged learners. Uh, we are working very closely with 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 him pick, really picking up on his um, expertise but that quote there is really sort of emphasizing how important those uh, relationships are the way in which support is offered you know being sensitive um, to how those um, su that support is is offered and looking at things through the lens of those disadvantaged pupils and their families that's really important to ensuring that the solutions actually do relate to the um, barriers. And there also we have included staff. Clearly, um, staff are, will be incredibly uh, important uh, in that in that process. Absolutely uh, pivotal. They are the ones pro su supporting um, those young people. So I just wanted to flash in front of you one a slide that you may well have seen um, in in other places from us about triangulating um, data. You know, you should always be looking for um, three sources uh, when you're considering um, an and issue and that shouldn't be any different uh, when we're looking at disadvantaged pupils and, and their needs. So, you know, what are the data reports? What are the reports from your um, chief executive or your head, head teachers? But what are those stakeholders um, uh, telling you? And if you govern at school le level, what are you see, seeing and hearing yourself? If you're a trustee of a MAT, what, what are your academy committees, your local governors um, uh, telling you? So feed that into the, the data so that it's a much richer picture that you are uh, uh, looking at. Um, here I'm absolutely um, ladling on that fourth core function of, of governing boards, um, listening to stakeholder voices is an absolute um, essential part of what you do. You can do it in uh, many different um, ways. We know currently how people um, are doing it uh, in the broader scheme through our annual survey. What what we don't necessarily know enough of and we will will through this project try to be interrogating so what difference did what they told you make if you have done particular pieces um, of listening about disadvantage, may, it may be just for you know one small um, group, whether it be the parents, uh, the pupils, or the the staff. What did you learn, and what difference did that make in in the way in which the school um, was um, uh, reacting to that evidence, or indeed the governing board was reacting in that evidence in terms of your role in in monitoring? Clearly. We can't do um, a webinar on disadvantage with 
without mentioning the EEF, the Education Endowment Foundation. Uh, I'm sure um, uh, most people on this call will know of the EEF and absolutely your school leaders will or, or should. Um, so they have uh, produced a guide on being an evidence-informed school governor and, and trustee um, as, as well. But that guide particularly looks at three levels um, of uh, uh, tackling uh, the attainment gap for disadvantaged children, improving teaching, absolutely important to what schools do um, for everybody, but then targeting that academic um, support secondly. And then their third tier is wider initi initiatives um, to address those other non-academic barriers to success. And our argument here and the argument in the Essex way is that those wider initiatives don't get enough discussion, don't necessarily get thought about um, enough. And if we're really looking at that list of barriers and wanting to overcome them, then we must um, look at those uh, wider initiatives. So this is um, another source of important evidence from NFER, um, the Research uh, Institute, looking at um, a range of ways in which uh, barriers can be removed. Top of that list, which is one of the reasons I want to include it here, we've got the whole school ethos. Uh, absolutely important, the way in which, um, the culture in which uh, the school, the trust, thinks about these, these young, young people. Secondly, we've mentioned behavior and attendance and high quality teaching for all. Um, meeting individual learning needs, that's what we're talking about um, for most of this uh, half hour so far, but then deploying staff effectively. We would actually put the emphasis there as well on staff CPD. We think, see that as absolutely core to, well, delivering education generally, but, but also with this particular um, set of young young people so this um, is a great uh, graphic to really focus in on that point that I was making um, earlier about does your response uh, match the barrier you've got a fire here for want of a better word uh, but are you actually extinguishing it with the right um, solution and there is such a long list of things actually that we could have put here on the left hand um, uh, side uh, it may well be that you've got other things that you're already doing in your school and and trust so let's not necessarily just go for the obvious or the familiar or the comfort zone or the usual you know it's thinking about that young person and what they they need and from from whom because those relationships are so so important So just before I hand back to Fiona to talk about the um, toolkit, there's a couple of things that I wanted just to reinforce. That point about interrogating your culture um, and, and ethos, but also how do school leaders report to your boards on this work? Because we're saying emphasize individual needs. Well, actually your data doesn't necessarily tell you that. So one thing that you can ask for is as it were anonymous, anonymized stories. So you can say, you know, give us a half a dozen um, pen portraits of um, a pupil who was disadvantaged and how you um, uh, responded uh, to that. You've got a real job in making sure that the policies reflect this approach and reflect your culture um, and, and ethos. Staff CPD I've just spoken about, but I really feel can't be um, emphasized too much. We are worried at currently with the funding situation being what it is that resources and indeed time so often it's about time uh, may not be so easily available for development but it's absolutely um, crucial i'm speaking to the converted on the next one because you've turned up today given time up to um, engage with this and the last thing is collaborating with with others those in your communities you will find of course they're experiencing the same um, 
um, families with disadvantage as, as you are. And working together as a network locally can be so powerful, as indeed they are. They are doing in Essex, but I'm sure in other places as well. So back to Fiona to talk about what we've produced to try and help. Okay, thanks Emma. So first of all, I just want to apologise because when I read out the data that identified the disadvantage gap um, in months, at the, by the end of year 11, I said that um, children from Black Caribbean ethnicity backgrounds were 30.4 months behind. That's not. That's children who are Gypsy Roma and traveller from the Gypsy Roma traveller community. Um, uh, and the, the the table is correct on the PowerPoint slide. I did have a brief moment of panic um, and it's Black Caribbean children are on average 10.9 month, um, months behind their, peer, their white peers um, by the end of year 11. So I thought I'd better get that out of the way, first of all, sorry. Um, right, okay, so what, what we've been doing over the past almost a year now is um, working with partner organisations who are experts on each of these pupil groups to, pro to produce um, a toolkit to support governing boards um, in supporting um, these pu pupil groups and ensuring that the right measures and uh, the right resources are in place for those pupils, the right systems and processes in, are in place. So we have six documents that we are publishing, four of which um, have been published today, um, and the link is sitting within the text just there. So the first document is an in introductory piece of guidance, really looking at disadvantage and looking at the evidence um, um, around disadvantaged pupils, um, more of a reflective, um, wider look on, on what that looks like. We, we also includes, in fact, next slide, please. Uh, it includes um, 25 top tips from um, that come from Mark Rowland um, on, on how to address disadvantage. In, um, in a more um, embedded way um, that runs across the whole school. So I can't fit 25 top tips on this slide. So I thought I'd go with one from each of the four categories. Um, so first of all, removing that deficit discourse, as we mentioned earlier on around disadvantage um, and its impact on learning and participation in school life. And I noticed there was a comment earlier on by, are we almost doing that by talking about disadvantaged pupils? And, and it's such a battle and and, a, and a, a real balance to get between identifying groups that are at risk and not labeling them. Um, and, and it's a really tricky, tr tricky, tricky one to get right. Um, but this is very much just looking at those groups of pupils who are statistically more likely to be at a disadvantage um, and not assuming, um, which brings me nicely onto the next point, which is assessment, not assumptions. Um, and that's really not assuming that a child is at a disadvantage or not at a disadvantage advantage but really looking at that data um, that we talked about earlier on and what does that look like for the pupils within your um, within your school or trust um, priorities and partnerships so poverty proofing is a really key, real key ingredient um, of inclusive schools um, where disadvantaged pupils are thriving so this should cover both formal and informal um, curriculum and we go into that in a little bit more detail in the toolkit um, and evaluation and implementation. So governors and trustees should play a key role in that rigorous um, uh, dispassionate impact evaluation, um, decoupling impact evaluation from accountability. So it's really kind of looking at um, what do, what is the data telling us? What do we get from that? And, and addressing the need um, and building the strategy around the need rather than um, trying to fit the need into um, a strategy. Next slide, please, Emma. <laughs> So um, the first toolkit, uh, one of the one of the toolkits that are being published today is special educational needs and disabilities. There's some key takeaways there. Again, it's coming back to um, the diagram that we looked at earlier on, where it's thinking about um, looking at um, your your um, your strategic direction and and all of your, your board priorities through the lens of SEND. Um, one of the things that um, Adam Bodison says in, in his handbook for governors is that um, whilst it's important to have a, a link governor or a governor that's champion SEND, every, every governor or trustee is a is a send 
governor or trustee and just making sure that we're looking through that lens um of course that kind that again um taking um nick, nicking one of uh, mark Rowland's quotes which is inclusion is at the heart of decision making and thinking engaging with parents and carers we've got a really good piece of guidance actually that we um produced with parent kind on parental engagements i'd really recommend that um, and that is linked to within the toolkit um, and the approach that's needed to embed inclusive practice. Again, the toolkit signposts you to, to, to resources that will be useful for and, and equip you with the tools that you need to address these things. So um, Whole School Send have a really good resource there, free to sign up and access that. Um, but yeah, how to embed inclusive practice across all schools. Uh, next slide, please. OK, um, oh, and this is just briefly signposting to some of our guidance that we have for um, the governing board on, on SEND, um, kind of really looking at sort of practical ways um, that governors and trustees specifically can address that whole school SEND approach within their setting. OK, um, so poverty is another pupil group. So. Um, we talked about we've talked about identifying through data um, where where there may be pupils within your school or trust that are at risk of disadvantage. It's very difficult with poverty outside of the pupil premium measure because we don't ask as children um, enroll at the school. We don't ask parents what their salaries are, so we have no real way of knowing um, what that or, 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 or knowing who is. Um, living in poverty outside of that pupil premium measure, but there's a really good resource, I've put the link in there, um, which shows child poverty levels across, na across nations, regions, local authorities and parliamentary constituencies. So it'll give you a really good idea um, of, your, of your local context, which I'm sure you'll have anyway, but that's a really useful tool that you can kind of play around with there. Um, and also, again, poverty proofing your school. So it's a great way of ensuring that I mean I've, I've I've kind of made up that um that little term there invisible poverty it's not a it's not an official um term but those who you who you, who you don't necessarily know are living in poverty poverty proofing your school is a great way of making sure that they're not impacted by the cost of the school day um, and this this toolkit was produced with the child poverty action group have been absolutely key in in kind of contributing to that and there's lots of really good resources from others as well as the child poverty action group in the toolkit that um that can kind of support you in addressing educational disadvantage there next slide please Okay, and of course we have our guidance, which is the pupil premium guidance, and it's a guide for governing boards to really explore some of those barriers faced by those who are eligible for pupil premium and how to use that data um, effectively in, in addressing that um, and um, also contributing and approving the school strategy for spending that pupil premium. I did see a comment earlier on about that pupil premium and who it's who it should be spent on. Um, the the DFE do um, say that it's for um, a specific pupil groups. Um, however, it and well where um, where disadvantage divide, defined by socioeconomic stand, um, um, status, it does say that it can be used to benefit other pupils as long as uh, where, where schools feel it's necessary, as long as they are approaches that are being put in place um, that will equally be benefited by those who really need it. Um, OK, next slide, please. So vulnerability, um, again, the Children's Society have been pivotal in kind of working with us on making sure that um, what we put into the um, toolkit can benefit yourself. So it covers things like the effective use of monitoring, safeguarding and behaviour data um, in, and how that can um, help to identify vulnerable pupils. Understanding that link between safeguarding issues, vulnerability, vulnerabilities, indicators and appropriate intervention 
uh, interventions and and how, how important that is. Um, one of the things that I will just say on this point as well, just labouring on that staff CPD point that Emma has said, if you, uh, this is covered in the toolkit, but if you have a look at keeping children safe in education, it will tell you some of the key um, safeguarding issues that really should be covered, such as um, child exploitation, sexual and criminal, um, serious violence um, and others. Um, so really ensuring that within your local context, if there is a specific issue within your um, within your locality um, around child sexual exploitation, for example, that's a really important thing for staff to understand the signs and what that might look like, how that might impact on behaviour um, and, and kind of not misreading, um, misreading those signs as poor behaviour rather than an issue. I think um, I think I can't remember who it is. I think somebody quote somebody um, says it really well, which is um, a, a, a child with a problem, not a problem child. Okay, next slide, please. Thank you, Fiona. So that brings us up to date, and I was just going to close us with a small sort of so what next um, so as you heard there's two more sections of the toolkit which will be out um, uh, I was about to say this month but before Christmas uh, in in December but we've really taken the model for this work that we used last year for um, greener governance so we very very much want to make this absolutely practical and useful for what you need so this is the beginning, as it were, of our resources, not the end. So we have got there um, four dates for our leadership forums in the spring. And as you may know, um, these are actually member um, forums, but we run them four times because members asked us that they wanted to meet with people who were in the same um, position as themselves. So we have one for SATs, one for maintained schools, one for local academy committees, within MATS and another for MAT trustees. So we will be having full conversations with our members um, about what um, else you would like to see. And we are completely open to the idea that actually you might want, um, you know, templates differently. You, you may want um, toolkits in particular forms. So please, please do um, engage with us um, and uh, come with your ideas and your requests and we will um, try and then produce a different version of the toolkit um, around the, the early late spring, um, early, early summer. And just before I close, um, I wanted to take advantage of pointing out uh, to those of you that might not have not have come across it. We do have our free e-learning on um, EDI, equality, diversity and inclusion. So, again, that's another topic which cuts across um, the, the work that we've been talking about today. Very, very interrelated. Um, this is free for, for, for everybody um, to use. It's relevant to um, senior leaders as well as um, governing boards. So please have a look if you haven't had a chance. And um, lastly, uh, the I never uh, talk about well-being without mentioning the Well Schools Movement, which is a resource for all sorts um, of uh, uh, work on well-being, um, both staff well-being and um, pupil well-being. So again, that's a free resource. And if you're not signed up to that, please do um, have a look. So we've come to the end of our webinar and there um, is Fiona's email address because she very much wants to um, hear, um, hear from you all again. Oh, she's got a hand up. I think she wants the, do you, would you like the last word, Fiona? <laughs> I wasn't after the last word, but I did mean to say it's so important. These toolkits and that guidance um, is, is, is really an evolving document and a living document. We don't just want to 
to publish it and that's it. We are going to be adding to it. I've noticed a couple of comments about this, the dates of data. As the new data is published, we'll make sure all of that is updated. Um, but we really want to hear from, from you as well. What are you already implementing that's, that, that you see is working? Um, or, or, or what would you like to see in the toolkits? Um, and, and as Emma's already said, we are going to be looking at other pupil groups as well, such as um, those who have English as a second language, etc. So, so please do get in contact and do feel free to kind of put your thoughts and ideas forward. It will be an evolving document. I wanted to put that out there. I didn't want you to think we're just sending it out and that's it. Absolutely. We, we want it to be useful in terms of everything that NGA produces. If it's not practical for you, we're, we're not fulfilling our function as well as, as, as we should be. So we absolutely look forward to continuing these conversations um, in the spring with you. But thank you so much for your interest in the topic and thank you for giving us the time. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day.